This project has uh, also um, allowed us to do some work with BDC that I think might be useful to other researchers. Uh, so as you're just talking about, um, so I, I'm a researcher at Brigham Women's Hospital and Susan Redline's group. And Susan was the speaker here last month, if anybody happened to be here. Um, and yeah, so she spoke about our, um, our, our thinking of BDC as a platform to enable data sharing. So that is one of the, the great features of BDC. And then the I'm sort of talking about the flip side, and I'm going to be talking a little bit more about computation on BDC. Um, so as you mentioned, I have a top med fellowship. This uh, work is funded under that. And uh, the fellowship is to look at pathway-specific polygenic risk scores. And this is a work that I, I uh, have been working on for a couple of years, and I have done some work in UK Biobank. But I'm really looking forward to implementing this in top med. And one of the reasons for that is that TopMed has uh, an excellent data structure that we're going to be able to use to increase efficiency. So we'll talk about that more later. And the goal of my uh, fellowship is not only to create these uh, computational resources, but to investigate the relationships between sleep duration and blood pressure using polygenic risk scores and, and in specific um, the interactions that may occur with polygenic risk scores and sleep duration within specific pathways when we're looking at the outcome of blood pressure. Okay, so there's going to be a little bit of a hybrid. So I'm going to talk about the background, uh, the polygenic risk score background, the way we assign pathways. And then we're going to get into actually some of the um, platform specific and uh, computational aspects of this as well. And so we, we've we been thinking about this for a little bit. In fact, I have some previous research uh, working in top med with polygenic risk scores. So the big new challenge for me in the, in the fellowship is to work with the data in BDC. And again, the idea is to, to create this resource that can be used to, for, for other analyses, including um, other polygenic risk score outcomes, not only for blood pressure, and make pathway-specific polygenic risk scores easy to compute across the ecosystem. Um, but as I mentioned, so BDC is a little bit of a learning curve. There's um, some unique features to it. The cloud has um, just enormous power and utility, but we have to think about how to implement our scripts a little bit differently. And one of the aspects that we've been thinking about is the um, the workflow and pipelines that are created on BDC. They can be um, an impediment to getting started if you're a new BDC researcher, um, but we've been thinking about how to create a universal pipeline that will be able to run arbitrary R scripts so you can compute, you know, ad, ad libertum um, the, uh, the statistics that you need from the data. Um, so that's that's the second part of the talk, and that's something I've been working with Dave on, and he's just been an excellent resource. And um, you know, if if you're a fellow or part of the ecosystem, we just have a lot of uh, really great people to rely on um, for the for getting up to speed. But hopefully, the work that we've done will will uh, enhance that in the future. So, without further ado, let me get right into it. Um, so let's go to the, yes. Uh, can we have the next slide? Or am I? Yes. Uh, yeah, should have the motivation slide up. Is this? Got it, got it. Got it. Yeah, okay. I don't know. It's a little bit delayed here. All right, thanks. Um, so uh, the pathway specific polygenic risk scores. So there's been a lot of interest in polygenic risk scores in general. Um, but there's also been a lot of new developments and, um, and, and, and features that we can take advantage of in terms of um, the bi biological knowledge that's being generated about the genetic data that we have. And um, so the GWAS paradigm is sort of um, unstructured, as we might say. But we can uh, go into that and think about how, um, how it reveals biological um, biological meaning by grouping things within um, within pathways. So that's the, the basic idea is to think about, can we produce a pathway-specific polygenic risk score that summarizes an individual's genetic risk within a pathway of interest? So we're capitalizing on GOS that have you know, grown exponentially and have great power to characterize even weak effects. Um, and we're also using polygenic risk score algorithms that allow us to assign uh, conditional effects 
to virtually all of the common SNPs. So with that in mind, we can think about using uh, different sources of data, including EQTLs, chromatin data, and machine learning approaches that are able to map SNPs to genes. And even though the, these methods are, are, um, are being pioneered now and, and are not fully reliable, the idea about looking at the pathway level is that in aggregate, we think we'll be able to capture a lot of good signal um, that combines both our knowledge of pathways and the knowledge from the GWAS of the genetic effects on a specific outcome. So the pathways can be derived from various databases. And as well as data driven methods and omics experiments. And our, our basic hypothesis, as I was just mentioned, was that the pathway level is an important intermediate level between SNP level analyses and overall polygenic risk scores. Um, there has actually been quite a bit of use of polygenic risk scores with, with uh, G by E, um, but it doesn't really comport with our sort of prior expectation about the way G by E might work in that. Um, an environment that uh, affects a particular population probably impacts the genetic risk and modulates it at the uh, pathway level rather than uh, universally. So um, we're on this, the, the next slide, just catching up. Um, the gene annotation method. So just sort of some background, what, what are we doing to create these um, maps between SNPs and genes? Well, the most obvious thing is that we, we do need to include um, exonic SNPs because those are the gold standard. We know exactly what gene they impact. Um, but there, there's another, uh, there's a, a number of other sources of information that we can use, including the Fandom 5 resource um, that linking that's linking promoters and enhancers, promoter capture high C, which has been published in a couple of different places, um, as well as the um, 3D Genome Interaction Viewer and Database, which is a compendium of these PC high C data, as well as I think many people are familiar with GTEC and the annotation of EQTLs by tissue, and a Gene Hanser, which which combines a number of these annotations with some other um, work. Uh, currently, we're also looking at a, a couple of different other sources for annotations, including activity by contact and some um, machine learning and deep learning approaches. Um, but you know, if if all else fails, I think people have been thinking about this uh, pathway-specific polygenic risk score before. I think it's even been published on, but basically using genomic location, and and we don't think that's as, as specific as we can get given the data that we have these days. Um, so in order in order to um, to assign the the SNPs, we want to take the highest quality data first. So we take the gold standard exons, and then we move down from there. And at each stage, once we've annotated a specific uh, locus or, or, or SNP, um, we take that out of contention for further annotations. So basically what that means is that if we do end up using genomic location, we only use it for those variants that have not been assigned based on a um, prior, uh, based on a specific source of um, experimental data. So that should improve our, our uh, specificity. So we can assign 25% using these data sources without the genomic location, and then it goes to 70% after using genomic location. And we have an average of 1.2 genes assigned per annotated variant. And so the next slide, please. Thank you. So just some from background, I think I, I looked at the uh, the answer to the quiz or the, 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 the introductory question about your background knowledge. And you know there, there's a variety of, of experience here. So forgive me if, if it's something you know quite well, but polygenic risk scores are basically a subject specific summary of genetic risk across the genome. And that's uh, computed by taking a weighted sum of your allele counts. Um, that, and, and those are effect alleles, which means they're oriented towards um, a specific reference allele, which may or may not be the one in the reference genome, but in any case, the weights are directed in terms of whether that allele, your effect allele, increases or decreases um, your, your risk. So I think I, I uh, make this too complicated, but the point is you count the number of, of um, effect alleles, you multiply it by a effect size, which is from the GWAS 
can either be positive or negative. And the key thing here is that uh, the modern PRS methods are using LD to avoid double counting. So if you think about a GWAS, the uh, variants that are in LD with each other that are correlated generally um, share a higher effect size, but only one of uh, the uh, the entire effect size should be spread out amongst those when you combine them into a polygenic risk score. And if you do happen to know which one is causal, and some of these methods do provide a probability of being causal, you should assign more of the weight to that SNP rather than the others. So those provide important pieces of information that we can feed into the pathway specific algorithm. Basically, what we're doing is summing over the sets that have, the sets of variants that have been assigned to the pathway through particular genes. We can compute first at the gene level and then aggregate to the pathway level, or we can compute directly at the pathway level. And the pathways here are just simply sets of genes, which are derived from various databases such as KEG or Reactome or MSIGDB. So um, those are some of the background pieces of information. We can pause there if there are questions about how these, um, these risk scores are computed and the general strategy and motivation for creating them. Um, and wait for just a second for questions. Um, and then I'll present some of our prior results. Is there anybody on the call that has SMPs they need help annotating, whether from a, a GWAS or otherwise? Maybe a, sh a show of hands, or even if you want to unmute and and uh, explain. <laughs> So one thing I didn't mention is that um, I will provide the methods that we use um, both as scripts, but also I will just go ahead and annotate the top med data. So if anybody's analyzing top med, uh, the annotations that we, we use will be included in a metadata file that you can look at. Oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, did not know that, Matthew. That's great. Yeah. So if anybody here is um, using top med data, something to definitely... Um pay attention to. If there are no questions, we can continue, but if anybody wants to uh, speak up, feel free. We'll give it just a couple more seconds before we move on. In terms of the pathway, uh, do you have any specific number of SNPs or genes, or how do you define the different pathways? Yes, Maybe so good question. So this is some genes yeah. could be in multiple pathway. Exactly, yes. So that is one of the crucial questions. So in fact, we're allowing multi multiple annotations. So a particular SNP may be assigned to two different genes. So as I mentioned, on average, among the annotated SNPs, we assign uh, 1.2. So that means that you know so, some are getting mul multiple annotations to different genes. So that's at the SNP to gene level. And then you're absolutely right, you know, pathways, particularly these larger pathway databases may have multiple versions of the same pathway, which are therefore um, overlapping and correlated. And so there, there is going to be, um, I guess you might be hinting at the question of what's the multiple testing burden, questions like that, but we are just doing it in a very straightforward way. We're allowing multiple annotations at SNP to gene, and then gene to pathway also can be assigned more than once across a full pathway database. And you know, I think there's sort of a, a standard correction, um, uh, 10 to the negative six, I think, for, for correcting for pathway testing. And so we're, we're kind of using that as, as our threshold. Um, but you know, if you have any comments about that, um, I think that's sort of an arbitrary threshold. Uh, but I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you. Uh, perfect. Okay, great. Um, so I guess we can move forward to the next slide. Great. Okay, so this is from my prior work with the UK Biobank data. And I'm not going to present the most obvious uh, results, which are do these pathway specific polygenic risk scores predict the target phenotype? And the answer is they do, and they're quite reliable about it. So I'm gonna move past that and look at an analysis of the relationship between a trained polygenic risk score, which is targeting coronary artery disease. 
and not the coronary arteries, artery disease outcome, but in UK Biobank, they've measured um, C-reactive protein. And so we're gonna use that as the outcome. And so the, the reason why I'm presenting is there's a little bit more interest in being able to look at these uh, effects and you know the p-values are pretty robust. So the question is, um, what's going on when we look at a coronary artery disease polygenic risk score? Well, you know, it, it's it's sort of averaging over all possible um, um, medi mediating pathways, right? But when you, we look at specific pathways, in particular VEGF, we see an interesting result, which is that the risk SNPs for the coronary artery disease polygenic risk score are actually predicting um, a reduction in CRP levels. So that's what, what these negative values are showing. And so I think that's an, an interesting factor that um, sort of gets glossed over when we just think about the entire polygenic risk score. Um, but there, there are many, maybe underlying contradictory effects that you see when you, when you subdivide it and look at effects on related outcomes, even something that's fairly well established that CRP is related to coronary artery disease. Um, so the other thing is, uh, I'm going to present some results in a second that involve obstructive sleep apnea. And you may know that um, sleep apnea is a disease that, that causes cessation in breathing overnight, and that can create a hypoxic environment. And one of the pathways that we're looking at is hypoxia inducible factor, and that pathway is one of the stronger pathways in this analysis, um, which, is, which is a, sub, a subset of um, uh, a uh, hypothesis driven subset. But nonetheless, it, it does have this effect of around increase of 5% per standard deviation of the, the um, pathway specific HIF1 risk score um, for, for CAD. So that means people who are uh, have increased risk for CAD in the HIF1 pathway also have increased CRP due to the HIF1 pathway. So that's some of the interpretations for this analysis. And I, I wanna move through this quickly. I'm gonna do both and then pause for a second if there's any questions, but let's move on to the second analysis. So the second analysis, as I mentioned, is looking at obstructive sleep apnea as a risk moderating environment um, for, for the uh, outcome of coronary artery disease. And so in this case, we're again using the same CAD polygenic risk score um, but in this case, we're interacting that both as a full PRS and at the pathway level with OSA as a monitoring environment. And essentially what we're doing is, a, um, is equivalent to a subset analysis to see what the effect of that pathway specific risk score has amongst the OSA patients or uh, subjects in this, in this UKB sample. So the, the overall sample is quite large, it's UKB. Uh, there is around 26,000 uh, CAD cases that we ascertained on the methods we used here. It's around 5,000 OSA cases. Uh, we're, we're, we have a joint CAD OSA uh, case count of 711. That is the limitation on our uh, analysis for a G by E with OSA. So this is again um, motivated by prior uh, hypotheses driven by you know the literature and thinking about. OSA. So some of the pathways that we're interested in were HIF1, VEGF, NF kappa beta, and TNF. And uh, HIF1 and, and VEGF, but, uh, VEGF is vascular endothelial growth factor. They're both potentially related to response to hypoxia. And uh, VEGF can actually uh, potentially be involved in uh, the heart creating new, um, new blood vessels um, in response to hypoxia, which could be a protective factor. And so we do see this very interesting um, risk inverting effect on the OSA um, VEGF pathway specific polygenic risk score in that those with OSA for their risk increasing SNPs that increase their risk of CAD within the VEGF pathway, they actually have um, what in the context of obstructive sleep apnea, they actually have decreased risk from those same SNPs. And um, you know that 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 is 
potentially aligning with, with this idea that um, hypoxia is a is a um, interesting and um, um, powerful uh, biological context in which to look at this uh, genetic risk. So I'm just going to go one more slide forward um, to talk about what uh, what this may mean. So basically, we're saying that OSA has sort of differential effect measure modification of the risk increasing genetic variants that predict CAD across different pathways. And in specific, we found this result in VEGF, uh, where in non-OSA, the CID risk variants are primarily deleterious um, it, within VEGF. And they most likely you know, operate by increasing vascular permeability or, or um, promote plaque formation through uptake of foam cells um, and oxidize LDL. However, in VEGF, we think something else might be going on. And the, you know, one hypothesis is that this is related to this angiogenesis effect from VEGF that may affect the heart muscle, muscle collateralization and the increased blood flow. So th that is just one example of this G by E. And as I mentioned, in the top med work that I'm going to be doing, we're going to be looking at uh, actually sleep duration as a um, potential modifying um, gen genetic effect modifier in uh, looking at blood pressure. Mm, excuse me. So I'll just pause there for a second if there's any questions on these on, on these analyses. And again, feel free if you want to unmute yourselves to ask questions aloud. Hey, Matthew. Um, I have one question. So this is Dilan. Um, so how many cases, how many uh, control you use in the UK? So all the UK data as a control for the UK cases? Yes, yes. So um, uh, essentially, yes, the, the entire UK B was, was the control. Um, wow. But again, the way it's set up, the design is... Um, is to r run an interaction analysis, um, including you know the the two main effects. Uh, we did find a we did find a main effect from OSA as well. So, um, in any case, yeah. Uh, one of the questions that we had with respect to the UKB data is that OSA itself is is fairly underreported. We think uh, around one percent, and uh, that should be higher. Um, so that's typical um, with with. Uh, uh, you know, under diagnosis. And I think you're maybe alluding to this, basically saying that uh, the, the, the um, controls may be um, including some OSA cases. We actually tried to uh, reduce that possibility by eliminating some people who are snorers with sleepiness. Um, so, so yeah, it's a little bit more complicated than I had time um, to uh, prepare right there, but that's a great question. Yeah, second question is how many variants you use in the, in the so after you set up a criteria, right? So you, you you select maybe you know a number of variants for your or calculation. How many variants used for? for the um, so I don't have the exact number for these pathways off the top of my head. I may have included in the supplementary slide. I'm not sure if you have those access, but basically on average, we're talking about about a hundred variants per, per gene and a hundred genes per pathway. Although, um, as I recall, VEGF was around. 30. Don't quote me on that right now. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jen Forsyth, um, I have a question about the p-values that you presented in that last table. Were those just the p-values output like standard by the logit model? Um, or did you do anything to control for the fact that there are different numbers of SNPs in each of these pathways? So there are different numbers of SNPs in the pathways. So I guess if we're looking at um, the the fact that, you know, in terms of a GWAS, we sort of have um, an omnigenic model in the sense that there, there are effects, even very small effects assigned to almost every SNP. But I think we can still be confident in this result because what we're doing is we're looking at an independent sample. So UKB is not the training sample, it's not the GWAS. So what we're doing is we're looking at a standardized effect size. So basically compute the pathway specific polygenic risk score and, and standardize it to the UKB sample. 
And so it's um, it's essentially already uh, corrected for the number of SNPs. And what we're looking at is the uh, the effect size estimated in UKB, which is you know sort of looking at a fresh independent sample and looking at the p-value associated with that. Yeah, it is from the model exactly, but uh, I think it is valid from that perspective. Right, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I think for interactions that it may be less relevant, I think there's just some some discussion around if you're just doing just a straight pathway-based polygenic risk score and it's a subset of the SNPs and you're yes. looking at the amount of um, the effect size that you get from just a straight pathway-based polygenic risk score, how to grapple with you know mm -hmm. the different numbers of SNPs. But I, yeah, yeah, what you're saying so, here, I think it, it's not as relevant. Yeah, exactly. So you're pointing to two different things. So definitely, I think there's a um, we we have an additional layer of protection when we're looking at just the, the our, our main uh, result of interest is the um, the effect and the p value from the interaction term. And so that's one thing. And then the other thing is we are standardizing, you know, by pathway. So yes, in, in a sense that if we have a larger pathway, we do expect to capture some signal, even if it's um, sort of um, on, only in aggregate. But the fact that we are standardizing it, you know, means that it is an interpretable that for whatever set of genes is there, um, that we can compare one pathway to the other in terms of um, in terms of its effect size um, on on the outcome scale. So um, that leaves out the final detail, which is, of course, that some pathways do contain shared genes, which would, in that case, probably have to be in the same model to get accurate uh, assignment of effect size. But yeah, great questions. Um, and delving into Thank some you. details that I didn't put in here. Exactly. OK, so um, yeah, so let's just summarize the uh, results so far and the, the basic strategy. Um, just, yeah, so basically we're saying that um, when we're looking at these uh, polygenic risk scores at the pathway level, um, we're looking at interpretable effects and ones that are more flexible than the uh, traditional PRS um, by environment model when we're looking at uh, G by E. I, I forgot to highlight, but, but our uh, total CAD PRS by OSA result was null. And so, you know, it, there's the likelihood that some of these um, these interaction effects may actually be contradictory to each other and less likely to be seen at the full PRS level. Uh, but but if if the pathway is the correct uh, biological scale, we may be able to reveal some of these. Um, and so uh, the 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 assumption underlying this, the thing that that would make this work as a um, targeted analysis, is that when we look at G by E, the PSPRS should um, should aggregate similar effects or, or, or effects that are perturbed by the same environment in the same direction across the pathway. And I, I think that's that's somewhat reasonable in that um, so some of these pathways are um, unified by by a common output or um, or or the other fact is that that uh, we're talking about um, Things that, that, that are definitely targeted to a specific direction of effect in the outcome. And when they're perturbed, they're, they're likely to be upregulated by upstream regulators as well, that uh, would indicate a shared um, direction of perturbation. So these, these are some of the, the assumptions that you have to think about going in. But with those assumptions being met, we think that they're able to enhance power and to reduce multiple testing you know, compared with a SNP by E analysis. And that's one of the motivations for us to be using this as actually a follow-up for some prior work um, that we did with top with uh, sorry not with top end but with um, the idea of uh, uh, G by E looking at sleep duration and its effects on um, the genetic risk for high blood pressure. So that sort of wraps up some of the applied work, and now we're going to transition over and start thinking about some of the technical details. Since we paused a second ago, I'm just gonna move forward with this um, analysis. Oh yeah, so, so I had a slide on this. So this was just talking about a second ago. Uh, our group previously uh, looked at a interaction analysis and we did find, um, we did we'd find results for, uh, across four blood pressure traits of systolic, diastolic, mean arterial and pulse pressure. 
we did find results for interactions with sleep duration in terms of, of genetic risk. Um, so that's that's what we're working on now, and the and the methods that we're working on is the focus of this next section. So next slide, please. Okay, so if you've been thinking about how this uh, data gets stored, um, you probably realize that there's a lot of uh, combinations, and you know we could be storing this uh, one at a time in, in a list fashion. But if you just expand everything and look at an assignment, so either yes, no, um, the uh, variant maps to a particular gene, and then we account for different methods, including you know different eQTL um, uh, tissues. What you're looking at is something that's quite a large array, and it has about 10 million uh, 10 trillion entries in it. And so if we have a hope for st storing this efficiently, we want to do it as a sparse matrix. We want to uh, think about our data structures in advance. Um, but if we can just skip to the next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Great. So if we think about this in advance and set it up properly, um, storing it as an array is, is going to facilitate um, using matrix algebra to compute the final Polygenic risk, uh, pathway specific polygenic risk scores efficiently and all at once. And so the key stumbling block that we're overcoming here is that if we're even just to um, create the, the polygenic risk scores, um, pathway specific polygenic risk scores with um, some of the methods that are out there now, the most naive way would just be to calculate them one at a time. And I think it would take about 10 minutes um, for top med for per polygenic risk score. But of course, these are special polygenic risk scores in that they are not only the weights, but a subset, which we are recording as either a zero or a one in this um, array that I just mentioned, which assigns uh, variance to pathways by method. Um, so when we combine all, all together with the correct matrix multiplications, uh, it, it just all goes at once and it can be chunked um, by a, a subset of variance in the genome to be able to load something that fits in memory. Um, so, so that's our task, and that's what we've been thinking about in terms of the BDC implementation. Um, so next slide, please. <laughs> so uh, what, just, just to pause a second on the, on the output of that, um, if you keep um, more of your information in the output, you actually end up with um, a matrix of the subject-specific risk across different pathways. So we have the vertical axis is different subjects. Um, and then the, the columns, it's the different pathways to like polygenic risk scores. So either um, a pathway database, which might have one to 10,000 pathways, or if we just go directly to the gene level, we might have 20,000. And then we have the, the tissues. So one question about that is, is there additional information there? And this is something I'm going to look at in this next analysis. And that is to think about, is there a way to um, informatively decompose or uh, compress. And, uh, and um, yeah, for, for, for example, we could sum across all of the different pathways of polygenic risk scores that are still separated by pathway. And that might be able to inform something about the, um, the active tissue or, or the disease relevant tissues. Um, so, so there's a lot of information here and, and we're gonna explore some more of that. And my point right now is just that we're going to store the output um, you know, uh, of these uh, matrix multiplications in, in a way that uh, retains information. OK, so um, next slide. So the key piece of this uh, infrastructure and the thing that you know, somebody like me who's got a biostatistics background and not necessarily informatics background, um, I really like you know square matrices. I mean, in the sense of rectangular matrices, things are just populated, and that I can do uh, matrix algebra on. And there is such a uh, data structure in R, and that is called the GDS format. And you know, it, it stores basically the same information as VCF, uh, but it has it structured differently, and it has it structured in terms of being able to call up these. Um, these basic data structures within a, uh, a a larger data structure. So the actual genotypes is one small part of it, and the genotypes are stored in multiple different ways so that if you want to have a 0, 1, 2 genotype pulled off the disk, you can do that, or you can also have raw data pulled off the disk. And um, 
and, and one of the great features of this is that there's no wasted bits in the storing of genotypes. Um, so that um, not only that, but any NAs are, are compressed as a sparse matrix. And we can reach in and because the, 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 the blocks of gen genetic data are addressed by variant sample, we can basically grab any piece of the data that we want to. So what this means is that we can basically take the entire TopMet data set and um, uh, crunch it down into a, a few hundred gigabytes, around, around uh, 300 gigabytes, and just work with that as, as if we had, um, had a data frame in R, essentially. Um, <clears throat> so next slide, please. So just to illustrate this a little bit further, let's skip to the next slide. Um, so if you just have a subset of samples and variants that you're interested in, it basically doesn't cost, cost a lot of overhead to just pull those out and work with them. Um, and you know we're, we're, we're getting um, a, a efficient blocks of data to work with, as I said, for the linear algebra. So next slide, please. Um, OK, I thought I had one more. But in any, any case, uh, so that's the, the basic data structures that we're working with. Um, R has sort of an ecosystem of, um, of compute functions that work alongside the GDS format, um, some of which are, are implemented in Genesis, which is you know the uh, University of Washington pipeline for GWAS, um, um, including related samples. Um, so, so we're going to just take advantage of those. But what we've done is made the process of splitting up these computations um, into chunks of data much um, more easy for, for somebody who's used to writing their own scripts and, um, and implementing them on high performance computing clusters. And so the next step we're going to talk about right now is implementation of this, um, this new app in BDC for uh, running R scripts. Now I'm going to give screen share over to Dave Robertson, who will go through this and provide a quick demo. So Dave, I'll let you, of course, introduce yourself and yeah. get into it. Fantastic and great presentation so far, Matthew. Uh, my name is Dave Robertson. I'm a community engagement manager um, at Belsera, also part of the user experience coordination group. And it's been a pleasure to work with Matthew so far. So we're going to introduce um, something that's new. Um, called the Validated Cows R script runner app. Um, but take away for these concepts, Matthew, if you, if you want to. Sure. So just in, in case we're, we're um, not speaking the same language or people prior uh, experience with high performance computing or, or uh, um, you know, uh, building up uh, experience with Validated Catalyst. So here's some mapping between different concepts. So I think um, the key thing is that some of the names are changed, but the concepts are the same. And in particular, um, when we're running a job on a cluster, uh, we have a, a potentially lengthy script, which performs a bunch of different computations that are linked together and outputs a final result. In BDC, that's called a task. And then um, a task is built out of, um, uh, out of app components and each component can have different settings and are linked together into a pipeline. So um, the pipeline contains uh, job dependencies, or in this case, child tasks. And um, altogether, we call the, the pipeline a workflow, which links together different computations and results in a single, um, single output. So I think the other key thing is that when you're trying to figure out what the computing architecture looks like, when we have a computing cluster, we have access to certain nodes, uh, which you can request access to CPUs within the, within the node um, or cores with, within the node. And here they're, they're called instances, which are basically physical machines that are part of the AWS cloud infrastructure. And the, the, uh, the, the instances can be split up into virtual machines uh, and uh, within um, each instance. And, and you can request as well 
the number of cores per machine. So you have it all set up in terms of your concept of how you're going to parallelize. In our case, what we're going to do is split up um, the data. So we're doing data parallelization. And that process is called scattering in BDC because we have a, a array of job files which we scatter. And each job file has the parameters for the chunk of data that we're going to process in the parallel step on BDC. And then if you use um, like GDS and the seek array packages that go with that, that allows you to parallelize within each uh, BDC job. So there's two le levels to it. The first level is to scatter your data. And in, the, in this case, we have access to say, um, up to 60 instances, which gives you quite a lot of resources already. And then within each resource and um, the component jobs, you can parallelize by uh, running uh, multi-core within the jobs. Fantastic. So um, that was a great introduction to um, what a lot of researchers go through, which is um, how do I take what I was doing locally on my HPC or my laptop and deploy it into the cloud? So that's why Matt and I worked together to create something called an R script runner, which enables a faster deployment process. So we thought, how can we make this as simple as possible? And obviously, you know, we could do another one for Python or, or what have you, but this is specific to if you're part of the R ecosystem. Um, so you can, there's minimal, in theory, there's minimal changes to your native R scripts. There's no common workflow language coding is required. There's even minimal parameters because you can define all the parameters in your script ahead of time. For the base uh, Docker image, we're using the University of Washington Genome Analysis Center's PopMed master image, which is hosted publicly on Docker Hub. But um, if you have additional packages you want to use, um, such as Matt uh, did, you can install those on top of that base image and push it to a free um, repository that's hosted by NHLBI. At this address. Um, and it's very, so just as an example for the R script runner, which we'll demo for the remaining time, um, there's really only two main inputs. Um, there's some additional parameters, but the two main inputs files is what R script do you want to run? And what input files do you want to run against? And that can actually be a directory. So it could be all the, in this case, all the files in your project. Okay. Uh, do you want to walk them through this, Matt, Matthew, or should I? Oh, or I'm sorry. I'm going to get up running here. Yep. So I forgot that we discussed that. So we're in a project. Um, so just to set the stage, this is in a project called R Script Runner Demo. It's inside of Biodata Catalyst powered by Seven Bridges. Um, and you can see that there are several members of this uh, demo project. So how would you go about starting this? You would go to your apps. So um, you'd make sure you have this in your apps um, collection. So we're just calling it R script runner. Click run. And it brings up this draft task. So on the left side, you have your inputs, uh, which I talked about before, which is just the R script you want to start with and any, in, any input files. So I'll just use the file picker to select um, my script, which we're calling job initialize. And then for the all input files, I'm just picking our entire set of files. So we don't have to just pick individual files. Um, and then in the settings, um, this has to do a lot with how Matthew was able to get this to run performantly. Um, we need to decide um, how much resources per virtual machine. And can you remind me again? I think it's eight. Oh, I think we uh, wanted four cores, um, eight total machines, and uh, four gigs or two yep. gigs. Each one, I think and, and notice, so um, there's two, there's actually three steps. So there's a scatter prep, scatter run, and then gather. So it's essentially um, fanning out across multiple cloud nodes um, based on how you set this up. Um, and so those were the parameters that we set for that. And then 
We'll just call this test demo. And then a new feature, some of you may be excited about this if you've used the platform before. There is an early access feature that we can set up for you to request, to, to send the outputs to a specific destination. So we want to send these to all files uh, called results, Matt? Yep, exactly. And so if you have multiple outputs for your workflow, you can send them to different places. So then I'm just going to click Run. And we'll get that cooking. And while that's running, we'll just take a look at the um, what's, what's going on under the hood. Um, Great. So I mean, I guess the, the point is that if we've done our job correctly, um, this little point and click interface just basically turns the whole AWS infrastructure into um, a way to run an R script that might be, you know, not exactly uh, the same as doing it from uh, a bash script, but basically the same flavor of what you put into it. And so people who are familiar with, with uh, running jobs on HPC should just be able to step right into this and run their R scripts. Uh, there's a lot of stuff underneath it that Dave understands a lot better than I do, but we've you know sort of collaborated and tried to produce a sort of minimal um, workflow that takes anything you want to put it into, including whatever data, metadata, and scripts in the all files, and then a, a specific um, you know head script uh, that will run your job and and your underlying computations. And so that with that in place, um, we can go through the steps. Uh, we'll just step through the slides here. So uh, again, we're we're inputting our R script. We're putting any data and metadata into the app, and then in the scatter prep step, um, the the CWL the workflow um, is just running part of an R script, and in which in, in this case I've written out an example one, which sort of figures out what resources a particular uh, computation is going to take in terms of memory, time, and things like that, that might be important to know uh, before you actually could perform um, the, the running of the data parallelization. So that scatter prep, basically what it does is thinks about your data and your computation and creates a set of parameter files. And we're not actually creating data files. We're not creating like 60 different chunks of data that are, are actually being stored anywhere. We're just creating the parameters which subset your data. So if you're thinking about it in terms of subsetting variants, it just gives you um, 60 different variant chunks to work on, as well as a, additional um, any additional uh, parameters that you need for your computation. So um, in the scatter prep, the output is these parameter files. They're very light files. They're, they're not uh, data. And then it feeds it into the scatter run which again is data parallelization, but the way scatter works is it has to take a specific file and, and run a computation on that file. And that is just the light parameter file you fed into it and it gets scattered across a, a number of different virtual machines. And then the output from that step in the next slide uh, is going to be um, one, one per virtual machine. Uh, there's going to be a file or possibly multiple files if you're computing more than one result at a time. Um, and you, you may have to name them differently to keep track of them. But in any case, all of those files get fed onto the gather step, and you're going to be doing um, just a, a simple transformation in, ter in terms of either concatenating your data or summing your data to get your final result at the gather step. Um, and the gather step now has the ability to output to a specific file in your, in your um, project directory. Uh, which was, like Dave said, a, a new feature, which is going to make things a bit more convenient to keep track of things. And it it automatically saves the result in that case. Yeah, I think what's interesting here is that this is a sort of a universal approach, how to run things in extreme parallelization um, on either AWS or Google, um, depending on how you set up your um, project on BDC. You can do either one of those ecosystems. Um, so just to review, you know, thinking about how can I parallelize this either by chromosome or by certain number of GDS, um, certain number of SNPs, um, actually doing the work, well, it's got to run and then gathering everything back together in um, a specific output location and a, in a specific report or table. I think that's it for slide. Well, Great. You can... Oh, demo. 
Um, so it's running. Uh, we wanted to time this um, a little bit better, but um, good news is we ran it earlier today. So here's what it would look like, the same exact thing. Um, and so it's essentially outputting just two files to a specific location, all files and results. Here's uh, one of the output files. Certain files can be previewed, TSV, CSV, uh, text files, HTML or PDF reports can be previewed without having to download them. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of the stuff, a lot of innovation here is under the hood, so to speak. So if you go to your task that's completed, you can look at the logs and stats, and you can see the technique that we used. So if just really, really quickly, every green line represents a job or, a, or um, as Matthew likes to say, a virtual machine. We were able to do the prep, um, run several jobs uh, simultaneously, and then gather them back together. Cool. So that about wraps it up. I think if we have um, just a minute for questions, we might take a few questions. But um, thank you for sticking with it. Uh, if you have, this is the uh, end of the hour. So uh, happy to take questions. Uh, I want to thank you know uh, my my team, uh, Susan Redline, Heming Wang, uh, Tamar Silver, who are my mentors, uh, NHLBI, Top Med, the fellowship, and uh, especially uh, extra thanks to Dave for walking me through this uh, learning curve and and working on something that I think we were both excited about um, getting some feedback on. So. Um, so that's about it. Any any questions or feedback as uh, to what we've shown so far? Yeah, we have a raised oh, hand. John, yeah, go ahead, John, if you want to unmute. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I was just wondering if the um, that R system is uh, script runner. Uh, could it be also used to run um, a couple scripts as part of like a package and, a, and a, like a pipeline associated with that? Um, and or is it just like for single for like this, like um, multiple paralyzed um, uh, jobs um, issue? I think it's universal. I think it will work for your use case. Um, as Matthew described, there's two things you need to think about. One, um, how many virtual, you know, how many virtual machines do you want? So, to, to, you know, a lot of people might want to do one per chromosome or something. So you, you think about that at the high level, and then is there any way within your R package or script to make it uh, run faster? So, there's two two steps to get it get things to run faster. But absolutely, it'll take any R script. Um, just so I guess the point is yeah. it, it it allows you to do whatever you want to do within the script and you can change a chain as many calculations together as you want to, basically as long as those all parallel parallelize in the same way. So if they can be fed in chunks of the genome and you can and you can follow through on that um, pipeline with multiple steps and then put put an output, then then you're good to go. Okay, thanks. Uh, Fabian is asking in chat, the R script runner is not publicly available on BDC, right? It's not available. It's still in alpha, but I can add you to the project if they go look at it. And we did have a poll that was launched. So if you are interested in using it or learning more, uh, make sure to answer the poll and we can get in contact with you. And you can also be kept up to date for when that is does get into uh, being publicly available as well. Good question. We are thanks at time, for the time, but oh, go ahead, Matt. No, I just said and thanks for the interest. We we are at time, but if people want to stick around, we I think we can take a few more questions as long as you have time, Matt. I don't want to hold you back from any other obligations, though. Yeah, no problem. So feel free to unmute, raise your hand, uh, questions in chat, and thank you, thank you again, Matt. It was a very very interesting presentation. 
Uh, I think we had a lot of really good conversation, but again, happy to take any last questions that people might have. Hey, Matt, uh, this is Dilan again. So one quick question. So you're assuming because you take the beta from the, the previous the study, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Summary statistics. Mm -hmm. So if, for example, in, if I do set up, for example, you know, in terms of control, in the cases, for example, you have a remove maybe a, a portion of the, the cases because maybe, you know, due to whatever reason, then you have to rerun uh, the G1 study first, then to get the, you know, your beta. Uh, so I guess it depends on, on what study design you're implementing. Yeah, um, because just case of control, for example, you know, for the uh, CED study, uh, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. you, you assume it's weak. You utilizing all the, the data from your know, previous GVAR study, you know, they, they, they gave you some mm -hmm. statistics, mm -hmm. then yeah. you convert to, to your beta. So if we have, for example, some right, we know, notice, you know, yeah. maybe the case is not, uh, they can split the two groups. So for example, you know, they have to rerun the, the calculation, rerun the GVAR first, then do Yeah, that. so, I mean, I, I see what you're getting at. L let me just take it um, from what I understand the question. Um, so if you, for example, um, are looking at a subset of a heterogeneous outcome and you want to look at how you predict that outcome, yes, we expect the betas to become miscalibrated. I think that's what you're alluding to. But yes. we're kind of using, well, first of all, we're, we're not using direct GWAS betas because we are accounting for like the, the modern PRS algorithms, which do LD uh, block uh, adjustments as well. But uh, to get to your point, um, the, the, the betas would become miscalibrated if, if you change your outcome a little bit. But when we do the, the PRS level and we do the pathway level, uh, we are just standardizing the, um, the risk scores. So we're, we're just taking basically the idea that we have a, a range of risk and, um, and, and, and that it sort of has a, a distribution to it um, and standardizing that distribution. And so we're not really even uh, holding on to the, you know, the effect size of the original um, original GWAS. What we are holding on to is the stratification that comes from those um, those effects being implemented at the individual level. And so, so that's what you have to think about in terms of what our final effect sizes are, are quantifying. Um, yeah, because for the CADs, we know from, you know, I think it's from literature, they maybe, you know, older it may get older certain age is part of the the the, the risk factor i mean certainly mm -hmm. yes I yeah sure sure exactly exactly yeah, yeah. so i mean I, I would say that absolutely your your betas will become miscalibrated but but what we're looking at with the pathways fix risk scores is basically um in your final um independent data subject level data you're going to be looking at effects per standard deviation of the risk score um so what you just hope is that you have a, a good signal in there, okay. um, but it, it won't be on the original scale of the original GWAS. That's absolutely right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice work. Very nice work. Well, thanks. Okie doke. Um, just wait another minute. Um, Amber's still here. Thanks a lot for all of your help with us today. Um, yeah, thank you so much again for presenting with us. It does look like we're down to about 11 participants. I will leave the call open for another moment just in case anybody has a dying question, but uh, we will have Matthew's email also in the forum and in the materials that get sent out post event, so you can always follow up directly. Uh, and thank you again, Matthew, for all of your hard work on your slides and a wonderful presentation. And of course, thank you to Dave as well. Yeah, thanks so much for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you, everybody. Have a great afternoon. We'll see you next time.